Namaste. I'm Rev. Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in beautiful San Diego. Thank you so much for subscribing to this channel. Please make sure that you like the video you've just watched and consider making a contribution on our app or on our website. It's really easy to do. And thank you in advance for that support. It does make a difference. I said to you earlier that during this month of December, I want to focus on the characters of the Christmas story, and today in particular, Joseph. And I was thinking about a theme, and the theme I want to focus on is the theme of invitation, Joseph's invitation. Next week, we'll take a look at Mary's invitation. The following week, the community's invitation. And when I think of the word invitation, I think of the idea of participating in something meaningful. When we get an invitation, as probably we've gotten a lot of invitations or are starting to now, invitations for parties and, and gatherings, it's that our presence is desired. And the one sending the invitation is probably planning something special and significant. And I think that when we look at characters in the Bible or really in any sacred text, and we look at it through the eyes of symbology and mysticism, we find so much rich meaning and help. And I think in the story, the Christmas story, and the character of Joseph, we have that. We have an invitation. And I think that Joseph's, Joseph's invitation is an invitation to participate fully in life. I think that we can learn from him by looking at his way of living and, and the little that we know of him and the significance of him to look and see what does he invite us to do in, in our lives, how to live more fully, mystically and metaphysically. Think about him for a moment. Think about what you know of Joseph, maybe from Sunday school, maybe from recently rereading the Christmas story. We know not a whole lot, but we know he must have been a pretty significant person because of the role that he played in Jesus' life, right? We know that he was believed to be a pretty simple person. He's believed to have been a carpenter. He was called to be Jesus' guardian, though we're told he was not Jesus' father. We are told he was called to be his guardian. He must have been a man of great love to take Mary, who was pregnant, as his own and to raise the child Jesus as his own. My mom would say, he was a keeper. He was the kind of guy that, that was a keeper. And wherever we look at him um, historically, what we want to do is pull out from the things that we know about him, ideas that can be helpful to us. Some of what we do know is that he was there to protect Jesus. What we do know is there are numerous times in his life where he was told to do something that resulted in protection, if you will, of, of Jesus. He was told in a dream, he was told by the angel to marry Mary. He was told to flee Egypt. He was told when it was time to come back. In Joseph's life, according to the story, according to the narrative, there were numerous times that he was guided or told to do something. And if you think about it, the things that he was told to do might not have made complete sense to his mind. And I imagine that for every one of us in this room on a spiritual path, every one of us watching online on a spiritual path, we have had times in our lives where we have prayed for guidance, received guidance, and then wished the guidance had been something different, right? And then we start this arguing in our mind about, well, do you really mean that? Am I really, so, is that really what I'm hearing? And, and other times when maybe we haven't even been praying for guidance, but we seem to be receiving guidance, that we are to do this, and the this that we may be directed to do may not make a whole lot of sense to your mind. Nod your head if you've ever been in that place. 
I, I'm working through some things right now, positive things in, in my life and have been praying for guidance. And some of the guidance that I seem to be getting because it's waking me up in the middle of the night and it's not letting me go, my rational mind is saying, you've got to be crazy. This is ridiculous. This can't possibly be what you want me to do. And I'm still sitting in the question and still listening as, as the beautiful song, I am listening, I am listening. And it's okay to sit and listen for a while because sometimes what we seem to receive may not make sense to us. Just like I imagine that Joseph had any number of, of conversations with God about, really? Hmm, you want me to do that? So what are some of the cues that we can take from, from Joseph? Life skills that we might be able to practice to protect, if you will, the Christ child. And we look at the Christ child mystically in unity. We look at it as the divine in us, the potential in us. And so what might we learn from Joseph's way of being that could help us? I think there are a few things we can learn and a few qualities he possessed. Four of them, and then I'll drill down to them more deeply. The openness to listen. The openness to listen. As you think about your life and you think about qualities that help you live a better life, qualities that help you protect what is important to you, ask yourself, is there a place, is there importance in being open to listening? Another quality of his was obedience to follow. Now take a deep breath. I don't know about you, but that word obedience still kind of brings up a little something for me. And I know in a new thought community, even more so, even more so, but just kind of breathe into that word for, for a moment. Make it okay to even think about it. Obedience to follow. He certainly demonstrated that. And courage and flexibility to change. Courage and flexibility to change. Now, fleeing Egypt, coming back. Courage and flexibility to change. And then a willingness to take responsibility. So you think about those. Openness to listen. Obedience to follow. Courage to, to be flexible and to change. Willingness to take responsibility. Do you think that those qualities are important in being able to create a better life. I absolutely think they do. I absolutely think they do. So the life skill of Joseph, the openness to listen. We do get early warning signals. We really do. It doesn't mean that we pay attention to them, but we do get early warning signals. Here's a little story I pulled from, from my files from Reader's Digest. I was taking my mother for a drive and she'd scold me whenever I went over the speed limit. Unfortunately, I dismissed her advice, and a state trooper pulled me over and issued a ticket. As my mother and I continued on our way, I complained that he should have let me off with a warning. Joan, she said, I gave you the warning. He gave you the ticket. We laugh, right? Because we see ourselves, I think we can see ourselves in that story. We, we get warnings. We get warnings. And they usually, I think, because I think we live in a benevolent energy, in a benevolent universe. And I think that usually our warnings come more as a whisper initially. But if we're so busy or so preoccupied and we're not listening, then sometimes they turn into a shout and a scream or a, as we also call them here, a cosmic two by four, right? Why is it that we don't hear that still small voice? I think there are, can be any number of reasons we don't hear that still small voice. We have to be open to it. We have to be open. We have to practice. When you pick up the phone, even without caller ID, there are times that you recognize the voice on the other end of the phone before the person even introduces themselves, right? Why is that? Why do you recognize their voice? It's not a trick question. You recognize their voice because you have a relationship with them. You have a relationship with them. And you recognize when something is off if their tone of voice sounds different, right? 
Why? Why? Because you know them. You have developed a relationship with them. You have spent time with them. Now, God is not a them. We do not look at, at God as an anthropomorphic being. But this idea of a, a presence or this idea of an energy, this idea of a still, small voice, in order to recognize it, we have to practice listening to and for it. And I don't know of too many ways other than paying attention and being prayerful. Paying attention and being prayerful. When we get that kind of feeling, that hunch, that something, we get a thought or an idea that just doesn't seem to let us alone or that, that we wake up with and we go to sleep with and it keeps being there and it's suggesting a change in our life or direction in our life to pay attention to it, to listen to it, to inquire of it, what more would you have me know? What more would you have me do? We have to make time for it too, right? Have you noticed that this spiritual path isn't just a one, two, three thing? Have you noticed how it, it's a practice? You, you do know what I'm talking about, right? Just reassure me, nod, nod your head. <laughs> no, of course. We know it's a practice. And it's, there's, it's not that we ever get completely done with it. We continue to grow in consciousness, to continue to grow in awareness, to continue to grow in our ability to be responsive to that inner guidance, that still small voice. Sometimes the problem is we're listening to something else. What are some of the other things we might be listening to? Fear, I think I heard. Guilt. Shame. The, huh? The news. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we believe in unity. We believe in metaphysics that the guidance system is forever projecting its wisdom, if you will. And it's up to us to tune into it and to want to tune into it, to want to tune into it. So what else can we learn from, from Joseph's life skills? So openness to listen. What was that second one I said, that word that kind of brings, might bring up some stuff? Obedience, right? One of the most powerful ideas I learned years ago, but when I learned it, or when I first heard it, it really stuck with me. And it's the idea of listening for and listening to guidance. And the powerful piece is the difference in those two prepositions, for and to. I have to listen for to hear it, right? Or to sense it, to receive it. But I can receive it and do nothing with it. We could look at divine guidance, if you will, like a gift. I think it really is a gift. And somebody can give us a gift, but unless we receive it, we don't really experience the benefit of it, right? Unless we receive it and open it, we don't receive the blessing of it. That's an easier way, I think, of swallowing the idea of obedience. Joseph was obedient. I think that what we're talking about here is obedience not to another person, but obedience to the guidance that we receive, obedience to our spiritual wisdom. And so it's really not a giving away of our power to anything external. It's a giving our power into that force for good that we might call God or we might call by any other name, by any other name, obedience to follow. Sometimes we find it easier to follow the external stuff than to follow the internal stuff or to be confused by the external stuff or to take it too literally. Here's another cute one from Reader's Digest I want to share with you. Pulling over a car full of nuns because they were traveling so slowly a police officer asked the driver why she couldn't go faster. 
But officer, the nun replied. All the signs read 25. Sister, the cop replied, that's the route number, not the speed limit. Gee, I guess that explains why the others were screaming earlier, the nun replied. What are you talking about, the officer said. Well, the nun answered, we just got off Route 128. <laughs> I don't know if that's a true one. But obedience to follow, it's not some simplistic external thing. It's obedience to follow your spiritual truth, your relationship with the divine, with God, with the force, with whatever you call that thing. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's your obedience to it. And the benefit of that all accrues to you. All accrues to you. Another life skill from Joseph was his courage and his flexibility to change. He had to change course. He had to change direction. He had to change plans. How many of you find it really, really easy to deal with change? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, most of you are like me. I, I didn't see too many hands. I don't find it very easy to deal with change. And those of you who know me probably go, yep, yep, she's being honest. But I also haven't met too many other people that are super comfortable with change. We get, what, stuck in a, in a rut, right? And so one of the ways, I think, to break out of that, even just from time to time, is to be aware of what our general tendency at, tendencies as a human being are. And that is that we like sameness. We like predictability. But on the spiritual path, and especially as it relates to divine guidance, sometimes there's a lot of unpredictability. Sometimes there's a tremendous need to change and shift course, to not dig our heels in and say it has to be this way. So sometimes we have to change direction. Other times we have to change our ways of being. Learn new skills, learn new approaches, learn new ways of interacting. And other times we have to be willing to look at our willfulness and to move away from willfulness into something much more powerful and I think much healthier, and that's willingness. Take those two words and turn them in your mind for a moment. Willfulness and willingness. Sometimes we're so willful in trying to push a certain way or a certain direction in our lives. Think about the willfulness we sometimes have when we set a goal for ourselves and we hold on so tight to try to make that happen. Can any of you relate to that? Can you relate to that? What usually happens after time? What wins out? The old or the willfulness? It's usually the old. It's like the minute we let go, it goes right back to what it was, right? Because we were like this. Willingness is a very different energy, a very different way of being in relationship to our life and to our life's direction. Willingness is much more akin to flowing with the divine energy in the direction that it is going. It is opening up to new possibilities. It is moving where the energy of spirit would have us move. And we get better and better and better at knowing what that is and be, knowing the difference between it and any of those other voices, if you will, that might also be rattling around in our head when we practice. And sometimes we practice our way to success by some failings along the way by going, oh, I remember the last time I had that feeling to do X and I didn't, and I later regretted it. I'm going to remember what that feeling was, and the next time I have it, I'm going to pay attention to it. I'm going to be obedient to it. Does that make sense? So it's almost like we can't, we can't lose if we are paying attention. If we are paying attention. 
So take a deep breath in. And let that breath go. And I just invite you to consider the next important decision you might have to make in your life. And maybe you know what it is right now. But the next important decision you have to make in your life. Can you make the time to be in relationship with that decision in the way that Joseph was in relationship to those big decisions he had? Can you have the openness to listen and to listen deeper than maybe you have before? Can you bring in the energy of obedience to whatever sense or guidance or hunch you have? And can you be willing to have the courage and the flexibility to change and to take that on as your responsibility? I think if you can say yes, if you can make it real, these practices, you will find yourself on the other side of a much better decision and a much better answer, protecting something that is akin to the Christ child, if you will, in your life. Namaste. Namaste.